Good evening everyone and welcome to our midweek service. It's wonderful to see each and every one of you as we continue with this uh, series through the book of Proverbs, Two Ways to Live. Tonight we are in chapter 12. Um, uh, uh, before we come even to uh, chapter 12, I think it's just wonderful to note you know, how the book of Proverbs takes shape. Uh, if you have been with us, we realize how sort of in chapter 1 to chapter 9, I've been focusing on one big theme, one big thing um, in a particular chapter. But from chapter 10, actually all the way to the end, we see a, a mix of select proverbs. You know, it says the proverbs of Solomon. And, and kind of uh, the writer bringing all these different proverbs together. Not that they are not connected at all, not that they are jumbled up. It's not like they are just mixed up, but, um, you know, writing all this. And, and it's a very different style in the book of Proverbs, where we see he's bringing all these different things together. But uh, what we'll notice, one thing that is clear, um, we'll see there, there are a lot of contrasts in, in this. And I think that's where really rightly so to, to, to put it. The, the two ways to live come in. Because all along in this section, what we see are two opposites or two things being contrasted. And the writer lays these things side by side. And what he wants us then as God's people, uh, telling us clearly that it is one to choose. We, we have to make that, that choice. Which way are we uh, going to follow? Where are we, you know, where, where are we going to go? Which is the place we'll be going? And so that's where we are at um, uh, tonight in the book of Proverbs. Uh, let me just pray. The book has been read for us. Let me pray and then we'll get into chapter 12 uh, and just think through together. Lord, we thank you so much for tonight. Thank you as we come to your word. Pray that, Lord, you open our ears, uh, that we'll hear. And uh, please grant us that we'll be those who receive your words, who listen and receive so that we are wise, that we not follow the way of folly, that we'll not follow after, you know, wickedness, but righteousness. Lord, I pray for myself that help me tonight as I open this chapter to your people tonight that this will be clear for us all and it will um, change us to transform us, Lord, into the people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week we saw, we were thinking about, uh, we saw three things there. The way of the righteous, uh, we looked at words and their effect, and then we also looked at wealth. And we saw how the, the, the writer there contrasted uh, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Now we come to chapter 12 today. Um, let me ask you, um, I, I don't know who, whether you realize that um, in life, at every stage of life, really we are looking at this question, what is the outcome or what is the result? Wherever we are at in life, this question of the outcome, this question of the result comes to us. If you think of your days in, you know, school, maybe starting all the way from primary school to wherever you are at in your studies, you always looked forward to this. In fact, right now, you know, when you think of the results of the national exams, uh, KCP, then K KCSE, just you know, a few days ago. This is this this in everyone lives waiting for, for this moment. When you come to yourself, maybe you get to the days when you are in uni. Results, what is the outcome? Come to the point where you are thinking about relationships, when you're thinking about marriage, what is the outcome of all this? And the this the similar this seems to be a way in which if we choose one thing, then expect things to go one way. 
if we choose something else then expect things to go that way if we choose not to work hard you know then expect to fail in exams if you choose to work hard study hard then ex expect to do well in your exams you know uh, and kenyans we know this um, you know as we come to every election year how we we normally say uh, sorry there seems to be someone who's right so in terms of um when we come even around around the year of elections uh, the whole statement um actions have consequences you know uh, that's something we we know in a way um kind of yeah you you cannot do something in this way and expect the results to be another way you know uh, in, in football terms, uh, there's this this term, same old, same old. When when a football team is doing things the same way they do things, they can't expect to get the results they they really want. If they keep on you know playing with the same system, they keep on changing players. They don't have like um, a constant first eleven. Well, at the end of the day, whichever team you face, you don't expect that you'll pro produce results. At the end of the day, however, how, you know, how, however, whichever number of managers you try to bring into your team, it's still the same old stuff. You still haven't got the rhythm, and any team can come in and thrash you. That's kind of how you know, in a way, how life is. You know, you you have your work. The question will be, are you going to pass through the pro? period are you going to be confirmed will you be able to, are you going to be retained are you going to even be promoted and all that that's a very crucial 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 question here at the end of it all at the end of the day uh, will what we have done count will the path and the process we've chosen to follow yield the expected outcome or the result we really desire this this is what the book of proverbs really is bringing us to think about and chapter 12 where we are at today in a very big way uh makes this question what what chapter 12 is saying is the character of the righteous and the wicked have different outcomes that's really the the big thing about chapter 12 the if you take the righteous on on this side and then you take the wicked on this side. At the end of the day, the outcome of the lives will be different. The character of these two will be different. The, 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 the end will be different for the two of them. And this is something we ought to think about seriously because uh, when we think about wisdom, when we think about foolishness, when we think about you know, um, the right outlook to life and the foolishness or the character that is wickedness sometimes we think well it, it really doesn't matter how one lives it, it really doesn't matter uh, the way someone conducts themselves in, and all that so chapter 12 brings in this uh, these two like side by side and compares and says actually on one hand there is the righteous whose character is this on the other hand there is the wicked whose character is this and then for the righteous, there's, these are the results. These are the outcomes of their lives. And for the wicked, these are the results. These are the outcomes of their way of life. And that's what you're going to look at uh, today. Um, again, as I said, um, these are different proverbs. They seem to be quite a number of them together. But I've tried just to help us to think. I can think of them in four broader uh, categories to help just to see this, um, what is the message of this chapter rather than think of them like just being jumbled up, being mixed up and not being connected to, to each other. So from, we can, we can say, and again, this is not very neat. It's not like it is the one thing that is in every section. But I think from verse one to seven, uh, kind of when you think about the righteous and the wicked, what will be the outcome? Well, one of them will be stable and the other one will be subdued. Or in other words, one of them would be 
established, will be rooted, but the other one will be overthrown, will be uprooted. The righteous will stand, but the wicked will not stand. They will be overthrown. That's the first thing we see, we see there, the outcome there. Then the second thing we'll, we'll see from verse uh, 8 to 12 is that one, the righteous will be commended or will be praised, but how about the wicked? The wicked will be condemned. They will be despised. They will be blamed. They will not receive any commendation, but condemnation. Then from verse 13 to 23, it's the issue of speech. Uh, speech. So there's speech and silence. The righteous know how to speak. They know when to speak and when not to speak. They know how to use words. The wicked don't know. The righteous, even more than just knowing what to speak and when to speak, they know when not to speak. And then from verse 24 to 28 is the issue of steadfastness versus slothful. So the righteous are steadfast. They are diligent. They are hardworking. But the wicked are slothful, uh, lazy. So that's what we look at. So number one, from verse one to seven. Let me read that, uh, chapter 12, one to seven. Whoever loves discipline, loves knowledge. But he who hates reproof is stupid. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of evil devices he condemns. No one is established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous will never be moved. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. The thoughts of the righteous are just, the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. The words of the wicked lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright delivers them. The wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. So look again there, there the, the righteous and the wicked, the two of them, and notice in the whole chapter how there are these contrasts. And he makes the first statement, then the second statement. But. Says this, but. This, but. This, but. That's, that's how it, it is in the whole chapter. And just the first thing it begins there, verse one, verse 1 of chapter 12. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. Again, this kind of a whole introduction to the thing about um, a wisdom. The wise are those who love discipline. The wise are those who love re, uh, correction. But fools do not love reproof. This is a very strong term there. Whoever hates, he who hates reproof is stupid. You know, it's only the foolish. It's only the stupid who do not love reproof, who do not love to be corrected. But the wise love discipline. They love correction. It is in their being disciplined, in their being corrected, that they know how to live, that they, they gain even more understanding. It has to do with uh, how we listen. And discipline, again, is not just like, you know, the way we think in the kuchikwaki boko, you know, and you know, smacking, beating up someone. But really, here in, in Proverbs, the discipline, the correction, the reproof, first and foremost, it comes from listening to what is being said listening to the words of the wise. It is in listening, receiving that, and then the righteous will accept that. It will correct them. But the fool will hear none of that. The fool will go on in their own foolishness, in their own folly, and it will not be of any benefit to them. And something of us too, a good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of evil devices he condemns. So there again, there's a thing about the righteous, those who, uh, it says, a good man, a righteous person. They obtain favor from the Lord. But what about the other? The foolish man is condemned by the Lord. And again, remember here we're thinking about the, what are the results? What are the outcomes of the character of the righteous and the foolish? So it's not just here thinking about now what we do, but what we do, what does it bring forth? And here it says, one is praised by the Lord, is has this favor before the Lord, but the other one is not, is condemned. But I think for me the big thing there is, well, verse 4, of course, is a common verse. An excellent wife is the crown of a husband, but she who brings shame is like rottenness in his bones. And, and, and again, just those two ways again, 
One is the fervor that comes with the right way of living, but the other is the shame, uh, the rottenness that comes with the foolish way of living. But verse 3, no one is established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous will never be moved. And then verse 7, the wicked are overthrown and are no more, but the house of the righteous will stand. The wicked are moved, the wicked are overthrown, the wicked are uprooted. The righteous are unmoved, the righteous stand, the righteous are established, the righteous are secure, they are safe, they are stable, they are established. They will never be moved. You know, uh, think, think of this psalmist who says how those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion. You know, they shall never be moved. And that's the kind of essence here. Not being moved by what is happening, what society is saying, but at the end of the day, not being moved on the day of the Lord when the Lord brings in judgment. So that's, that's, the, that's the, the, the outcome there of the righteous and the wicked. The wicked will not stand, but the righteous will stand. They are stable. They are established. Number two is one is commended, the other one is condemned. From verse 8 to 12. A man is commended according to his good sense. But one of twisted mind is despised. Better to be lowly and have a servant than to play the great man and lack bread. Whoever is righteous has great reward. Whoever is righteous has great regard for the life of, the, of his beast. But the mercy of the wicked is cruel. Whoever works his land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows worthless pursuits lacks sense. Whoever is wicked covets the spoil of evildoers. Or the root of the righteous bears fruit. Now here is again um, what is the outcome of the righteous and the wicked. Well, the righteous are those who are praised, they are commended, but the foolish are despised, those of twisted mind. They are those who before God they are condemned, as we already saw in verse 2. They are those who have nothing worthy of commendation, you know, nothing worthy of praise. And, and that's just how life is, really, when, when you think about it, you know. Um, when, when, when you do that which is not of benefit to the society, when you do that which is not of, um, doesn't do any good to the society, because at the end of the day, no one will praise you. No one will praise you. No one will say good things about you. Uh, you, you know, in, how, uh, in our villages, you know that one thief, you know that one person who uh, steals around things and word goes around. They know that. They know, you know, everyone in the village knows that person. And if someone asks you about them, there will be no word of praise, but there will be condemnation, you know, being despised and all that. And it's the kind of thing that um, we see here. So those who are righteous, in the end there is the praise, there is the commendation. But those who are not righteous, the wicked, they are condemned. And I think of it even just when you think about the, uh, the, New, the New Testament. You know, Jesus giving, uh, when, uh, when Jesus talks about the servants, those who are given talents, you know, the one who went and worked and produced with what he had, had, uh, had five more. The end is told by the master, well done, good and faithful servant. But the one who had little and went and buried it, he did not use it. In the end, he's condemned to the thick darkness, to the outer darkness. He's condemned to the place where there's gnashing of teeth and weeping. And, and that's the kind of the, at the end of it, the will be, the results, the consequences of the kind of life that people have, vid, have lived here on earth. Then the third one we see there is speech versus silence, verses 13 to 
23. <clears throat> Speech versus silence. Let me read that again. An evil man is ensnared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous escapes from trouble. From the fruit of his mouth, a man is satisfied with good, and the work of a man's hand comes back to him. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. The vexation of a fool is known at once, but the prudent ignores an insult. Whoever speaks the truth gives honest evidence, but a false witness utters deceit. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Truthful lips endure forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but those who plan peace have joy. No ill befalls the righteous, but the wicked are filled with trouble. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims folly. Um, this is something we have already seen before, actually. In fact, just in chapter 11, we thought about words and how words matter, speech. And again here, we are being told about words again, speech and silence. You know, sort of as, uh, it starts at verse 13 by saying a man is, is ensnared by the transgressions of his lips. What you say, you know, for, for the evil, for the wicked, what they say are the same words that really ensnare them. Because they are spoken carelessly, they are not spoken without any much consideration, they are not spoken without you know giving it careful thought, and in the end, the same words condemn them. The same words ensnare. Um, but what about the the righteous? Well, the righteous from the fruit of his mouth is satisfied with good, and the work of a man's hand comes back to him. And again here, <clears throat> the essence of the words that we speak, what they do to other people, what effect they have on, on other people. So one, uh, verse 15, the fool, well, they just keep speaking. They think they are right. They speak and speak and speak because they know and they want everyone to hear them. But the wise listen to advice. The wise don't just speak, they listen. They give ear, they want to hear what others are also saying. When it comes even to evidence, to speaking the truth, well, we see that those who speak the truth in verse 17 give honest evidence, but a false, a false witness utters deceit. And, and these are things we see in, in, in our society. These are things we, we see very prevalent today. Uh, witnesses, you know, people being, um, <clears throat> people making up their own stories, saying their own things, and then we see in the in the end how those words, are, you know, then we condemn even those who are innocent. But look at verse eighteen. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Now on, on one hand. Those who are not wise will speak words rashly without, being it, without giving it any thought. And in the end, those words are like sword thrust. It's like someone taking a sword and thrusting you in your belly. But the wise, not just, they don't just withhold their words, but they speak words that bring healing. You just think about this, you know. Uh, and again, last week we saw this, we, 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 we talked, we, we saw how words really make or break. How sometimes though we, we think, you know, violence is just that which is administered physically, but even verbally, you know, it, it can be so tough. It can be so mean. I don't know how Kenyans are good at violence. Kenyans, we love choosing violence with your words, being uh, keyboard warriors, KOT, Kenyans on Twitter, and wherever we are, social media has come in. We, we are so rushed with words. 
and what you're doing we have taken this sword and just thrusting into people thrusting into people whatever small thing we see well then words just flow thrusting thrusting into others that's, that's, that's the way of the the foolish really just saying things without uh, giving them any consideration without giving them um, further thought and in the end we are hurting other people by our words I think we can never overemphasize just how we need to be careful um, how we use our words. We can never overemphasize just the need for us to not to be rash with our words. You know, words are only those you know that can be said and can never be taken back. Once once you have spoken, it is gone. Aita Rudi. And the effect, the consequences will will be there, already, um, already, if, you know. But for the wise, rather than just restraining themselves, rather than just knowing what to say and when to say it, and keeping silent, they go beyond that. But also, they speak for the benefit of others. They speak to bring about healing. May God help us to be those who are wise in how we use our words, in how we use our, our lips. And then the next one is uh, a steadfast versus slothful. Steadfastness versus slothfulness. From verse 24 to 28. The hand of the diligent will rule, while the slothful will be put to forced labor. Anxiety in the man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. One who is righteous is a guide to his neighbor. But the way of the wicked leads them astray. Whoever is slothful will not roast his game. But the diligent man will get precious wealth. In the path of righteousness is life. And in its pathway there is no death. So the aspects here again of fruitfulness versus unfruitfulness. The wise will be fruitful, they will be steadfast, they will be diligent in what they do. There will be those who are working hard. Remember we looked at the ant in one of the chapters we did. There will be those who are using what God has given them, working hard in producing, in bearing fruit of every kind. While those who are wicked, they are the slothful, you know. You know the sloth is that animal that is the <laughs> laziest, laziest of all the animals. Uh, and, and the sloth, there will, be a, there will be another chapter where we look at the sloth, which, which is very, dis, dis, you know, described in very interesting terms. The sloth puts his hand in the plate to pick food, but the sloth is so lazy to even lift the hand from the plate of food and put in his mouth. It's like when you're a child, umepewa chakula, unaanza kusinzia hapo, unajaribu hivi, you find you're putting the food, not in your mouth, but another place. So there's a way in which that's, that's the picture we are being given there, unfruitfulness completely. And that's the way of the, the lazy, that's the way of, you know, the foolish. Those who are not up, applying, using what God has given them, working diligently so that they can be fruitful. Fully, uh, there's also the issue of uh, being full versus being empty. Because when you are slothful, when you're not working hard, you'll be empty. There'll be no fruit. But those who are steadfast, those who are diligent and working hard, there'll be fullness. Uh, verse, verse 27 is quite interesting. Whoever is sloth, slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. Um, it's a very interesting one, and commentators have, you know, different things talk about it. But think of this in a, in, in a time of hunting. You know, so the slothful, because they are lazy even to hunt, they will not roast game. They will not have anything to eat. They will not have meat to eat. But the diligent man, other versions say, the diligent man 
feed on the riches of the hunt. We'll go hunting, we'll be very diligent, we'll be very careful, and they will get and come and they will feed the riches of the meat, the riches of the girl meat they have got and enjoy. And this is just something very practical, actually. You know, yile matunda ya jasho yako, to use that term, mimi nakula matunda ya jasho yangu. I worked so hard so I can sit down and enjoy. That's the kind of thing, really. And that's kind of the general outlook to life um, that we see. But in the end, with the righteous, verse 28, there is life. There is no death. But the wicked, the evil, there is death. There is no life in in them. So those are the four things we see there. Um, thinking about the contrasts that are being given there. When you think of the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked, what are the outcomes? Well, we see there. The righteous are stable. They are commended. Where they know when to speak and when to be silent. And they are steadfast. They are diligent. But the wicked, they are uprooted. They are condemned. They use their words carelessly. And they are slothful. Uh, applications. How can we apply this? Again, just going with the four things. The ways the wise are rooted and built up in Christ. I think more than just saying we are rooted in our deeds, what we do, or rooted in our character, really, we who are believers, we know that our character does not flow in and from us, but flows from who we are in Christ Jesus. If I am to be wise, then I have to be rooted in Christ, who is really the wisdom of God. And if I am rooted in Christ Jesus, rooted and built up and established in Christ Jesus, Colossians 2, 6 and 7, then I will not be uprooted. But the one who is not in Christ will be uprooted. They will not stand. They will be overthrown. So, are you in Christ? Are you rooted in him? You know, do you know him as your Lord? Are you living in him? Number two, whose praise are you seeking? Whose praise are you seeking? The righteous is commended. And this commendation actually comes from the Lord. We saw in verse 2 how obtains favor from the Lord. You know, rather than just seeking the commendation, the praise of men, but really from the Lord. Looking at the looking forward to hearing the words of Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. That is what we should be seeking. That is what we should be living for. That very last moment, that very ultimate day when we will be commended by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ Himself. Number three. Be wise, wise enough to know when to speak. And again, we have seen that in this portion, uh, verse 13 to 23, how we use our words. May the Lord help us. Uh, I, I don't know where, whether, whether you have gained that wisdom to know when to speak, when not to speak, when to be silent, but more than that, when to speak words that bring healing, words that don't bring division, that don't pit one against the other but words that bring reconciliation, words that are for peace. And number four, don't be lacking in zeal. You see, the sloth is that who has no concern for life. The sloth is that one who is so lazy, you know, they, they don't want to do anything. But really for us who are believers, being slothful is not something that should be mentioned at, you know, uh, about us really. We are those who, ha who are to be working hard. We are those who are to be diligent, doing that which God has given us. Whatever you find to do, do with all your might. Not doing it as unto man, but as unto God. Then Romans chapter 12, from verse, uh, verse 11, Paul writing with the church uh, in, in Rome tells us that, Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord. And that's what we need to do. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Serve the Lord. Don't be slothful. Don't be lacking in zeal. Serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Because we serve the Lord, our labor in the Lord is, in, is not in vain. As 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 tells us. May the Lord help us 
to be those who choose the path of the wise because we know the outcome of those who choose the path of the wise. I mean, God help us to run away, to flee from following the path of foolishness because we know the outcome of the path of foolishness. Amen.